মুক্তিযোদ্ধা ইন আওয়ার লোকালিটি ওয়ান ডে নিঃসর্গ অ্যান্ড অন্যসা গো অন অ্যান্ড আউটিং উইথ দেয়ার ফ্রেন্ডস দ্য গেউ টু দ্য ওয়েস্টার্ন এন্ড অফ দ্য ভিলেজ টু দ্য সাইড অফ এ বিল ফ্রেশ ওয়াটার মার্শেস অল অফ এ সাডেন দ্য সি সামথিং দ্যাট লুকস লাইক এ ডেখ্যাইং ফাইল দিস মেক্স দেম কিউরিয়াস আফটার টকিং উইথ অ্যান এলডারলি পার্সন দ্য আন্ডারস্ট্যান্ড হোয়াট ইট মাইট বি ইট ইজ এ সাইড অফ জ্যানসাইড অ্যান্ড ম্যাস কিলিং ওয়ান্স এ টেরবল ব্যাটল টুক প্লেস ইন দিস লোকালিটি ডিউরিং দ্যাট টাইম Some individuals killed a lot of people. This is why the place is known as Bodhubhumi. This monument was built in memory of those massacred people. Nowadays, no one talks much about those people. The place is almost falling off for lack of care. While returning, they all keep quite silent. Questions arise in their mind. When and where did the war take place? Against whom did the war take place? Why did it occur? Why were so many people killed? All these questions start overwhelming them. We want to know about the liberation war. On the following day, they start asking those questions together when they meet Kushiapa in history and social science class. She pauses for a moment and says, Wait a minute. This means you have visited the site of mass killing at the western edge of our village. You have done a great job. Well, you all know that our war of independence in 1971 was against the Pakistanis. Your questions indicate that you want to know about Mukti Jodha, the liberation war, occurring in our locality. Can you tell me how we can know about this? Shadin, a friend of Nishargo and Onnesha says, Through inquiry-based tasks, what other ways can there be? Excellent. Let's try to find this through an inquiry-led project-based task. Kushiapa says, We know what inquiry-based tasks are, but what is a project-based task? Joy asks. Kushiapa says, Do you remember the story titled Shamuli, 58 page? We talked about it while we discussed task activities. Students followed a process in that story. Let's follow the questions below to find out the characteristics of that process. How long did it take them to complete the task? Which process did they follow? What was the result? Who enjoyed the benefits of the task? When everyone completes their tasks, Joy makes a comment. He says, You must have noticed the students of that story first identified the problem, then they followed inquiry-based steps. Through these steps, they found answers or solutions to the problem to complete the task. They took a relatively long time. Villagers and jungle fowls and animals directly benefited from this initiative. In a project-based task, we try to solve any real-life problem through active inquiry. We also try to find answers to some challenging questions. Usually, these tasks are a relatively long time. We generally get some results through such inquiry-based tasks. Then we present these to the people involved. We do this so that relevant people may benefit from the findings. However, we need to remember one thing. A project-based task is not necessarily an inquiry-based one. A project may include inquiry, but it can also include model creation, creation of some other things, or solving a real-life problem. For instance, gardening, preparing wall magazines, creating models of Shahid Minar, a monument built in memory of the mother language martyrs, or a memorial, Paharpur Buddhist Bihar, solar system, or drawing of maps. These are some examples of project-based work. Sometimes the task can be completed in a shorter time. Discussion on Liberation War Identification of Problems, Questions for Inquiry Now Kushiapa says, Now let's talk about the Liberation War which makes all of us curious. She asks everyone some questions about Mukti Jodha. 
Students know some of the answers, and some are unknown to them. She has asked these questions. A. How did our country attain independence? B. Why did the war of liberation take place? When and for how long did the liberation war take place? D. Under whose leadership and how did it happen? E. Did only the famous people contribute to the liberation war? Did ordinary people like us contribute in any way? Did anyone know directly participate in the liberation war or cooperate in some ways? F. If someone did so, what kind of role did she or he play? Let's hear the story of Shohid Azad. At one stage, the class starts discussing the contribution of common people in the liberation war. At that point, Kushiyaba tells them the story of Shohid Azad. Many of you may have heard of Shohid Azad. During the liberation war, he was a buoyant young soul. Although a teen, he was a very brave member of a guerrilla group called the Cracked Platoon. He was never afraid of launching guerrilla attacks on the Pakistani army. At one point during the war, Azad was captured by the Pakistani forces. After a lot of searching, Azad's mother found out that he had been detained at Ramnathana police station. When she finally met him, she found that Azad has been tortured to such an extent that he could not stand up on his own. Seeing his mother, Azad told her that Pakistanis had proposed that if he provided all information about his co-fighters, they would free him. Azad's mother instructed him not to reveal any information about the whereabouts of Mukti Jodha's freedom fighters. She asked him to keep to it even at the cost of his life. Azad complied with her advice. Azad had become emaciated because of his starvation for a long time and he asked his mother to bring rice for him. When his mother came back with some rice the next day, Azad was nowhere. In her next 14 years, as a bereaved soul, Azad's mother never touched a single grain of rice. This is the story of Azad, just one of the countless martyrs. His stories of thousands of such martyrs are lying unknown in each of our localities. Will we ever get to know about these heroes, the valiant martyrs? Are we going to learn about such heroic mothers? We are going to know about them for sure. However, how are we going to do so? Our local history is not documented down anywhere. Will we keep ourselves only to the reading of history written by others? Or are we going to underneath the local history being lost in the abyss of oblivion? What if we start exploring the role of common people in our locality? Then we can make additions to the existing history of the liberation war. The whole class shouts together, of course. We want to add new chapters in the history of the liberation war. Kushiapa now asks, well, what things do you want to know about the liberation war in our locality? What happened in our locality? What brutalities did the Pakistani employ here? Onnesha asks, what did the freedom fighters do here? Prakriti asks. Shadin says, what did the common people do? Kushiapa writes all the questions on the board. At the end of the discussion, the questions are grouped into some key inquiries. The whole class intend to find answers to those questions as a project. Examples of key questions are as follows. 1. What kind of tortures were employed on the common people of this locality during the liberation war? 2. How did the freedom fighters make resistance against the Pakistani army? And 3. How did the common people help the freedom fighters? Let us plan our project-based task to find answers to these questions, the way Nishargo, Onnesha and other friends have been doing. Preparation, Team Formation and Action Plan Mili asks, how are we going to execute the task? Individually or in groups? What do you think? What can be an effective way of accomplishing it? Kushiapa says, 
Shadin says, Working it out individually can be quite challenging. Yet again, working as a whole class might create confusion. So it might be a good idea to work in small teams. Joy says, In this class, we are from different corners of this locality. I think keeping a student living in the same area in one group can help us work effectively. Another friend Mubarak says, it would be better to keep the number of group members limited to 6 to 7. With a bigger number, it will be difficult for all to participate comfortably. Then Millie says, Of course, we need to ensure that we will work in the same group without moving to a new one. Kushiapa says, Thank you for the good ideas. Now we can form groups considering these issues. Everyone participates in the formation of teams of 6 to 8 members based on their places of the residence. When teams are formed, Kushiapa asks if any member of their families was murdered in the liberation war. Robin informs all of his elder uncle was murdered during the liberation war. Kushiapa requests Robin to tell everyone about the events of his murdered uncle. Robin starts narrating the incidents to the class. At this stage, Kushiapa asks, from where can we know about more such incidents that took place in this locality during the Liberation War? We can learn from some of the elderly people in our locality, says Mukti. From the information on the Liberation War we find in textbooks, says Shadhin. From the local library, says Onnesha. Nishargo says, from the contemporary newspapers, Millie says, I have heard a lot of information can be obtained from different websites and other sources on the internet. Kushiapa says in a weird voice, Well, how do you know if the information from these sources is accurate? Everyone feels quite concerned. Joy offers an interesting idea. We can collect information from different sources then we can compare to sort out the correct pieces of information. Kushiapa tells the class, Now it's time to plan. Now you may recall the steps of scientific inquiry we discussed earlier. To prepare our plan, we can use the methods of scientific inquiry. This way, Onisha and his friends prepare a plan on how to accomplish the project about the liberation war in their locality. Of course, they take help from Kushiapa. Now let's make a plan to find out the history of the liberation war in our locality through a project-based task, the way this class did. Grand rules for teams. Kushiapa asks them if the team members want to follow some rules and regulations during the long-term group task. The students come up with different opinions. They assess the opinions and make a list of ground rules to be followed by everyone. They all agree to it. Some of the rules of the list Nishargo and her friends have prepared can be seen below. These are simply some examples of such rules. Others can prepare their list of ground rules according to their situation. Now let us make a list of ground rules that are suitable for our work. Group rules to be followed by the students. 1. Ensure essential safety for all members during the project work. 2. Express your opinion logically and confidently, showing respect for the opinions of everyone in the class. 3. Never hesitate to express your opinion for any reason. 4. After logical analysis, accept others' opinions with respect. 5. Ensure active participation of all the members of the team, irrespective of gender and ability. 6. Obtain the permission of the interviewees before interviewing them. Reviews of existing information, literature review. Today, Kushiapa asks, where can you find the events of the Liberation War in this locality, which have already been documented? In response to her question, all the students come up with many answers. Then they create a list of items like books, magazines, documentaries, documents, and etc. After a whole class discussion, they decide that all the teams should make a list of possible sources of the necessary information. 
then they would collect information from those sources within a specified deadline. They will discuss the sources, producers, obtaining information and obtained information with Kushiapa. The next day, during some spare time, Nishargo visits on Nishahum. They want to start working on the project on liberation war. Onisha says, We will follow the same method of conducting research that we have followed earlier. That will do. However, we need to think differently about just one aspect. Nishargo asks, What is that? Onisha says, In order to make inquiry about the liberation war, we need to know the significant information about this war first. However, the basic steps we learned about inquiry-based tasks earlier did not include a review of existing information or literature review. There was no step about collecting information by reading printed books, magazines and documents. In the case of inquiry-based tasks, it is often easier to determine what new information needs to be collected if the existing information is known. Nishargo says you are right. I think we can read some books on this topic. Also, we can talk with someone who knows this issue very well. In that case, we can get some relevant books and magazines from him or her. When the two friends have reached Mukti's residence and shared the thought, Mukti also become very enthusiastic about it. The three together request Mukti's grandfather. Mukti's grandfather loves reading books a lot. Listening to Mukti, Onisha and Nishargo's curious questions, he bring a pile of books on liberation war from his personal library. Then, in a fun way, he uses a question-answer narration technique to relate the necessary information. When did the liberation war happen in reality? Students, you are probably smiling on the sly after listening to my question. Who doesn't know that the liberation war took place in 1971? Why did it happen? We are curious to know. It's very simple. It was a war for liberation. Well, a question may arise. Whose freedom? Freedom from whom? Why did the question of liberation arise? In fact, you all know the answers. It was for our freedom, for the liberation war of the people of this Bengal that is, the then East Pakistan. We wanted freedom from Pakistan. There were many reasons why we wanted freedom from them. It's not that you aren't familiar with those reasons. Take some time to think through, or let us talk about it among ourselves to find out the reasons. To understand the reasons, the important aspects we need to discuss are movements to uphold right for mother tongue discrimination and deprivation, six-point movement as an answer to the problems, the 1969 mass upbringing, victory in the 1970 election and Pakistan's conspiracy. Let us briefly inform you about these issues from these books I just bought from my library. You can also learn from your teachers, elders, in your locality and from many other books. Language Movement you know about the language movement to some extent. Nevertheless, let me know something about it in brief. Immediately after the establishment of Pakistan in 1947, a question arose as to what would be the state language of the new country. The pressure from the central government of Pakistan was to make Urdu the state language. However, Bengali was the mother tongue of most of the people in East Bengal. That is, the then East Pakistan. Between the two parts of the Pakistan, the population of East Bengal was much greater in number, yet their demand for Bengali as the state language was being ignored. It was so unjust. So the intellectuals, teachers and writers of the country immediately protested against the decision. Students also burst out in protest. But the Pakistani government was so stubborn in their decision that the police opened fire on a students gathering demanding Bengali as the state language. A few demonstrators were killed. They are Bhasha Shohid or language martyrs. Abdul Borkot, Abdul Salam, Rufiquddin Ahmed, Abdul Jabbar, Shafiur Rahman and others. 
In the end, the government of Pakistan had to accept the demand for the Bengali language rights. We were victorious without bowing to injustice. Literature Abul Fazl therefore wrote, Ekush means not to bow one's head. Deprivation and Discrimination From the very beginning, the central government of Pakistan had been discriminating against the Bengalis. I am going to describe some facts from which you can understand the issue clearly. However, before that we need to understand what discrimination means. In simple word, discrimination means distributing things unjustly without equal or fair division of the things in question. A few examples below can make the point clear to you. Discrimination in the political sector First, the West Pakistani rulers were reluctant to provide autonomy to East Pakistan from the very beginning. Second, although Bengalis were the majority in Pakistan, the number of Bengalis in the cabinet of Pakistan was very low. The 1954 United Front government was removed from office in an unfair move. Discrimination in the administrative sector In 1956, out of 42,000 officials in the central administration of Pakistan, only 2,900 were Bengalis. Out of 954 top officials in Pakistan ministries in 1962, only 119 were Bengalis. Discrimination in military sector The quota for recruitment to the armed forces were 60% for Punjabis, 35% for Pathans, and 5% for the remaining parts of the West Pakistan and East Pakistan together. However, in the face of the demands of Bengalis, this number was later reformed a bit. In 1966, out of a total 17 top officials in the Pakistan army, only one was a Bengali. Economic Discrimination In the 1949-50 fiscal year, the per capita income of East Pakistan was 305 taka and that of the West Pakistan was 330 taka. In 1967 to 1968, it increased 355 taka for East Pakistan, whereas in the case of West Pakistan, it increased to 530 taka. The headquarters of almost all banks, insurance, and trading companies, including the Central Bank of Pakistan, were in West Pakistan. In Pakistan's first five-year plan, 113 crore rupees were allocated for East Pakistan, means present-day Bangladesh. On the contrary, 500 crore rupees were allocated for West Pakistan. In 1956, 56.4% of the total budget expenditure was spent for Karachi's development, while only 5.10% of the budget was spent for the whole of East Pakistan. To establish the new capital Islamabad, 300 crore was spent for the construction till 1967. In contrast, only 25 crore was spent for Dhaka city. The government of Pakistan made innumerable discriminatory examples in the running of the state. As a result, self-determination an independence movement arose in protest in the then East Pakistan. Sixth point as an answer. That juncture, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman was a trusted leader among the people and politicians of East Pakistan. He wanted to end this discrimination and deprivation. He wanted to ensure equality between East and West Pakistan in terms of resources, opportunities and everything else. Why should we accept injustice? He could not accept it. So he announced the famous six-point demand. We are talking about the year 1966. The six-point program included demands such as each province should be able to enjoy their own resources, keep the foreign exchange earned through exports and meet the expense of the province using their taxes. Mass upbringing at that time, President of Pakistan General Ayub Khan was a military officer. He threatened to retaliate with weapons. Later, a sedition case was filed against 35 people, making Sheikh Mujib as the chief accused. This is known as the historic Agartala conspiracy case. 
That of course had the opposite effect. The people started such a movement for the release of their beloved leader that Ayub Khan had to quit power. People made a chorus of a slogan, Jailer Tala Bhangbo, Sheikh Mujib Anbo. We will break the lock of the jail and bring back Sheikh Mujib. This was the mass uprising of 1969, in which the students and the mass people took to streets. Many including the young Azad and the teenager Motiur were martyred. The police and the military could not subdue the movement. Even the deaths of students and laborers did not frighten the common people. At this juncture, Sheikh Mujib became free and was conferred upon the epithet of Bongobonthu by Kendriya Chatra Shangram Parishad or Central Students Action Council. 1970 General Election After Ayub Khan, another military officer general Yahya Khan came to power. He understood that he would not be able to rule the way Ayub Khan did. So he promised to offer a new constitution and hold a national election soon. The election was held on December 7, 1970. The government assumed that even if Sheikh Mujib's party Aumi League would get some seats, the party would not get a majority in two provinces together to form a government. However, Aumi League has a landslide victory, meaning absolute victory or victory by a huge margin. Out of a total 300 general constituencies to the National Assembly of Pakistan, a total of 169 were allocated for East Pakistan. Out of these 169 seats, excluding two, 167 members were elected for the Aumi League candidates. As the number of members of the Pakistan National Assembly was 300, a party could form a government only if 151 candidates won. Nevertheless, 167 Aumi League candidates won in this election. As a result, they had a fair claim to form the central government. Bangabandhu could be the first elected prime minister of Pakistan. Most Pakistani politicians, military officials, government officers and bureaucrats could not accept this bare truth. Accordingly, they started devising numerous conspiracies. Their conspiracy and our non-cooperation Thus came 1971. The first session of the National Assembly was to be held in Dhaka on the 1st March. Pakistan was still suffering from the ailment of not conforming to the Bengali leadership. Pakistani politician Zulfikar Ali Bhutto was very ambitious. He conspired with a number of military officials and they involved President Yahya Khan in it. Their main goal was not to hand over power of Pakistan to Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib. Being under pressure from Bhutto, Yahya Khan terminated the first March session. Eventually, the people of East Pakistan became infuriated and they came to the streets. Bangabandhu also vigorously protested and started non-cooperation movement. Let us talk about the non-cooperation movement a bit. Non-cooperation movement means not to cooperate with someone. It turns into a movement when people start non-cooperation with any authority. Bangabandhu called for non-cooperation with the government of Pakistan. In other words, government employees would not join work and every office, court, school and college would be closed. In this way, government can be compelled to accept the demand of the people. During the British rule, Mahatma Gandhi started such a movement for the first time in history. After March 7, all school, colleges, offices, courts, mills and factories in Bangladesh were closed on the orders of Bangabandhu. The collection of taxes stopped. Bangabandhu's control was established everywhere except at the cantonments. In March 1971, in response to Bangabandhu's call for non-cooperation, the people of Bangladesh disobeyed the instructions of the Pakistani government and became completely non-cooperative. In history, it is known as the non-cooperation movement of the month of March. 7th March Speech The historic speech of Bangabandhu in front of millions of people at the discourse ground on March 7 was another great event of this period in 1971. 
there was pressure on the leader from the people to declare independence. Pakistan was waiting for such an opportunity. If Bangabandhu had directly declared independence, they were ready with arms to attack the people and leaders. In contrast, our leader was a visionary and experienced man. He tactfully ended the mass gathering by declaring independence in such a way that the tricky task was accomplished without sustaining any loss. The snake was killed, but the stick was kept intact. He declared, Ebarer Shangram, Amader Muktir Shangram. Ebarer Shangram, Shadhinotar Shangram. The struggle this time is a struggle for our emancipation. The struggle this time is a struggle for freedom. This acted as the message for freedom to all. UNESCO has recognized his speech, his 17 minutes in prompt speech, as one of the world heritages. Discussion Operation Searchlight and Genocide Seeing that the situation was getting out of hand, they offered to hold discussions to stop non-cooperation movement. Bangabandhu, as a believer in democracy, agreed. In the pretext of the talks, they gathered troops and amazed weapons in East Pakistan cantonments. At one point, they stalled this discussion and following their secret plan and returned to West Pakistan on the evening of March 25. Then at midnight, the most horrible massacre in the history began in the name of Operation Searchlight. Students, professors, intellectuals, men and women of different professions, writers, poets, artists, were all attacked by the occupying Pakistani army. They specifically targeted minority Hindus and Awami League activists. This went on for nine months. In this way, within three million lakh people were martyred in nine months. They did not spare Bengali women from excruciating torture. Bangabandhu's Resolve and Declaration of Independence Meanwhile, Bangabandhu decided that he would stay in his house and accept whatever was destined for him. In fact, he made his decision based on two considerations. First, he thought that if the aggressors did not find him, they would wreak havoc in Dhaka city. Second, he felt that he had such a familiar face that it was impossible for him to go into hiding. Also, it would be a shame to be a caught on the run. It would be better for everyone to face them with courage. However, before he got detained, he sent the historic message for the Declaration of Independence to the EPR forces after 12 midnight on March 25, meaning at dawn on March 26. The pronouncement was first sent to Chattogram by EPR wireless system. It was later sent to other parts of the country. This was our Declaration of Independence. In the declaration, he affirmed that the people of Bangladesh should continue fighting till the last soldier of the occupying Pakistani forces was expelled from Bengal territory. This is how our liberation war began. Shadhin Bangla Betar Some employees at Chattogram Betar, led by veteran artist Belal Muhammad, decided to run a radio station from Kalurghat in the favor of independence. Accordingly, they started the necessary work and many people joined the initiative. From this center, on the evening of March 27, Chittagong District Awami League General Secretary M. A. Hannan first read out Bangabandhu's Declaration of Independence. Later, many more read it out. In the beginning, this radio center was named Shadhin Bangla Biplopi Betar Kendro. Later, when a full-fledged radio station was set up in Kolkata, the word Biplobi or revolutionary was left out from its title. Artists, writers, journalists and intellectuals from all over the country went to Kolkata to join Shadin Bangla Betar Kendro. During the nine months of the war, music, stories, dramas and other programs in favor of the liberation war was broadcasted from this center to keep the people and the freedom fighters motivated. First Government of the People's Republic of Bangladesh Tajuddin Ahmed consulted senior leaders of the party and the members of parliament 
to form a government. Based on his initiative, the first government of the People's Republic of Bangladesh was formed on April 10, 1971. On April 17, this government took oath at Baithanatwala in Meherpur of Kushtia district. This government is also called Mujib Nagar. Government or expatriate government, Prabashi Sharkar, means Prabashi Sharkar. Bangabundu was declared president in his absence and Syed Nujrul Islam was given the responsibility of acting president in Bangabundu's absence. Tajuddin Ahmed took over as prime minister and Captain M. Mansur Ali, A. H. M. Kamrud Jaman, Yusuf Ali and some others formed the cabinet. Colonel Osmani was declared a general and was assigned to the post of the Commander-in-Chief of the Army. This is how the journey of Bangladesh government officially began. Nine months of war and victory One crore people took refuge in India to save their lives during the war. India not only gave them shelter, but also gave office space to the expatriate government formed by Bangladesh. They also provided training and weapons to the guerrillas, helped form naval commandos and air forces and provided all-out assistance in forming our regular forces. The Indian government was also active in maintaining balance in the international arena and gaining support from other countries. In the end, it formed the joint forces with Bangladesh and played an effective role in defeating Pakistan by participating in direct war. About six to seven thousand members of the Indian army also lost their lives in this war. Finally, at the end of nine months, the Pakistani forces formally surrendered to the joint forces at the Rescourse ground in Dhaka on afternoon of the 16th December. We became free from aggressors. To say it in the language of Bangabandhu, the Pakistanis could not keep us in subjugation. Bangabandhu says, Ora amader dabhaya rakte pareni. We became victorious, we became liberated. A new state with a red-green flag arose in the world map. Participation of people from all walks of life Notice that when the Pakistani army carried out the massacre, they did so without considering who were rich or poor, uneducated or illiterate. They did it irrespective of the identities of religions, caste, race, man or woman. They brutally killed the Bengalis. On the deadly night of March 25, the illiterate poor rickshaw pullers or slum dwellers were shot dead just the way world-renowned scholars of Dhaka University were killed. During the Pakistan period, the tale of 22 families was often talked about. They were unreasonably rich. There was only one Bengali in this list. He too had to leave behind his home in 1971 and flee along with his family to save life. Students, teachers and laborers also had to flee. To be brief, Bengalis of all walks of life had to forsake their home and country and become refugees. Nevertheless, among these people, many young people took part in the liberation war in groups. Young people from all walks of life took part in guerrilla warfare or as naval commandos or regular members of the armed forces. Now you might do one thing. If you look for freedom fighters in every family, you will get the news of one. Listen to their experiences and write down those narratives. After coming to school, you can listen to each other's stories. Only then you will realize how people of all religions and from all walks of life were involved. Even women were not lagging behind. You must have heard the name of Taramon Bibi and Kokon Bibi. Guerrilla Warfare Another issue is much of importance. In the Liberation War, the conventional war between the armies of the two sides was fought towards the end of the war. Before that, mostly guerrilla warfare took place. The guerrillas disguised themselves as ordinary people. Then according to their plans, they suddenly made attacks and quickly mingled with the general public. This tactic is called hit and run method, which means running away after making an attack. This is why the guerrillas needed secret shelters inside the country. 
They needed safe places to store ammunition and often needed reliable people's vehicle, boats and even rickshaws to move around. So it must be remembered that many families have contributed to the liberation war by providing these things. The housewives provided food for the guerrillas while the younger children acted as go-betweens. As a result, many have played their roles as freedom fighters in the liberation war without fighting with arms. You may have known about martyred composer Altaf Mahmud. Altaf Mahmud is the eminent person who composed music for the celebrated song Amar Bhai Rock Te Rangano Ekushe February, the 21st February that is stained with my brother's blood. You can read Ekaturer Din Guli, the days of 1971, written by Shohid Janai, martyr's mom, Jahanara Imam, to learn about the guerrilla attacks made at the Hotel Intercontinental. Besides this, it will be much better if you can listen to a guerrilla or someone actively involved in liberation war. You can try to find such a person to listen from them. The Role of Nature and Climate You may find it interesting to know about the role of nature and climate during the war. You know that Bangladesh is a riverine country. There are more than 700 rivers and canals in this country. Besides these, bills, jeels and wetlands are innumerable. It is as if every village had either a river or a canal. Moreover, there has always been the irritating presence of rainy season. The rainy season lasted for a long time in 1971. As a result, most of the year, the rivers, canals and bills were full and it was difficult to walk in the mud. Such a landscape and climate are very suitable for guerrilla warfare. The Pakistanis were not guerrilla fighters, rather they were traditional soldiers. Moreover, their country is uneven and dry. They did not have so many rivers, canals and bills. They did not know how to swim, so they were much afraid of the water. This natural environment was very advantageous for us in the war. The Pakistanis could not have survived those nine months if there were no traitors like the local collaborators such as Al-Badr, Rajakar and members of the peace committee. If these traitors were not there, at least the villages would have always been free. The Collaborators of Aggressors Unfortunately, before surrendering, Al-Badr Razakar as the allies of the Pakistani army murdered some of the best descendants of Bangladesh. In fact, they killed people throughout the year in 1971. Several political parties including the Jamaat Islami, the Muslim League and some other parties sided with the occupying Pakistanis. Under their leadership, peace committees were formed to act as puppets in the hands of an accomplice to the aggressors. They also formed Rajakar, Al-Badr and Al-Shams forces and used them to assassinate freedom fighters and pro-liberation intellectuals, teachers, doctors, journalists, writers and artists. We know that we have attained this independent country in exchange for 3 million martyrs. We have to add the incidents of cold-blooded torture of 2 to 3 lakh women. Thus, this freedom has been achieved through the sacrifice of many people. We have gained this red-green flag with the sacrifice of millions of lives and with the heroic role of many people. It is the sacred duty of all of us to respect this flag and protect the independence of this country. Bangladesh during the war you should keep in mind that the way people from all walks of life participated in this war, none of the 64,000 villages in the country was perhaps excluded from this war. The Pakistani aggressors set fire to Hindu neighborhoods in almost every village, burned down the houses of the supporters of Aumi League and carried out genocide in some places. How many sites of massacre spread all over the country the massacre of 3 million people is not an easy task. All over the country, this brutal massacre went on for 9 months. As a result, in such a situation, people did not have the attitude of celebrating Eid, Puja or other festivals as they used to do. 
how they could celebrate. Some families might have seen their sons going to war while their families were awaiting anxiously after receiving the news that their boy with his team would come at night to have some food. In some places, there was urgent need for arranging treatment for wounded freedom fighters while some others were working undercover for weapons to be delivered to a specific place safely. There were families who would have already lost one or more members already. It was difficult for them to celebrate the festivals when they just mourned the loss of someone dear to them. Every moment there was fear of death. The country was seen to be mortuary. The war did not stop even on the day of Eid al-Fitr and other festival days. As a result, people experienced a different kind of Eid or worshipping. Yes, you can also learn about the festival days of 1971 from the elders member of any family. That year, the 21st February was before the war and so it was celebrated with much enthusiasm. But Novobosho, the new year, came during the war, and so it could not be celebrated in a befitting manner. It is also possible to know the condition of the small tribes who celebrate Vaisabi, Sangrai, or other festival on the occasion of the new year. Based on this, you can do a project called Ekaturer Utshab, festivals during 1971. In 1971, secondary and higher secondary examinations could not be held properly. At some places, people in favor of the liberation war distributed leaflets asking students not to take examinations. At some other places, they displayed the writing on the gates of the examination centers. At some places, there were grenade attacks in the surrounding areas of the centers. All these were done to prove the world that nothing was normal in the country under Pakistan's occupation. What other ways could there be? Conclusion During the nine months of war, Bangladesh as a country was under siege, and life was abnormal. People awaited the hours of freedom even in the midst of terror. They worked for it. You should read Shamsur Rahman's famous poem, Tumake Power Jonne He Shadhinota to attain you, O Liberty. Mukti's grandfather finishes his chronicle. The words spoken by him created a sense of awe among three. Thousands of questions start churning in their mind. Nishargo and Onisha return home as they ponder over the questions. They decide to come up with an effective plan and get down to a project work. Inquiry and Data Collection Nishargo says to Onnesha, We accomplished a good job with the help of Grandpa and Kushiapa. With their support, we got a lot of necessary information from books and magazines. Now let us collect information from the elders of our family and locality. We will talk with them who have witnessed the Liberation War. They may know many important facts about the Liberation War. Malai speaks out. That's okay, but what will we ask them? Onesha says, you raised a good point. We need to develop an interview questionnaire. Let's do it. Interview questionnaire. Questions for inquiry. 1. What kind of tortures were inflicted upon the common people of this locality during the liberation war? 2. How did the freedom fighters make resistance against the Pakistani army? 3. How did the common people help the freedom fighters? Interview questionnaire Where were you during the liberation war? 2. How old were you then? 3. Do you know if Pakistani army came to this area? 4. In case of a yes, what kind of tortures and oppressions did they inflict? Here students can develop more questions as needed according to the samples above. A student can develop their own interview questionnaire following the sample question above. Let us develop our interview questionnaire the way Nishargo, Onesha and their friends have done. We can then collect information. Then Nishargo, Onesha and their friends get divided into teams and start collecting information from their families at first. All the members of the team assemble their information and discuss it. 
every team discusses the information they have collected with Kushiapa. Kushiapa asks each group to share at least one special event collected from their relatives. They have to share it with everyone in the class on behalf of the groups. After the presentation of each group, Kushiapa asks them to find out new information available about the places mentioned in their presentations. She also asks them to find out if the Pakistanis faced any obstacles in their locality due to the natural and environmental factors such as abundance of rivers and canals etc. The team look for those places. Then according to the team's decisions, they visit the places, collect data, using interviews from eyewitnesses. They also interview the senior citizens there. Before going to the field work, team share their plans with their teacher. Kushiapa oversees and checks if project is going on according to the plan of each team. She provides all necessary institutional support for the collection of data. However, she never imposes any opinion, rather she simply offers the group's necessary advice. When it is necessary, she provides technical support, such as recorders, cameras for collecting data, etc., and administrative assistance, such as giving a letter on behalf of the headmaster if special permission is required to enter a place. The student groups visit their respective localities, neighborhoods, and interviewed senior citizens or expert informants about the situation during the liberation war spatial incidents or significant places. They also ask them about the contribution of individual members of society, families, or groups. Attempts are made to find out the real situation of the local people during the liberation war. Moreover, data are collected about the interrelationship between natural and social environment and liberation war, non-communal environment, and the interrelationship between different festivals and the spirit of liberation war. They try to know about places with war memories and ones that are associated with events of the liberation war. They also try to know about eyewitnesses and other related things. Team members take notes of important details. In the light of the information obtained, they create a map by marking the memorable places of the liberation war in their area. They use various symbols and marks in mapping. Kushiapa cautiously ensures that each member of the team can participate in and contribute to different activities by turn. Data Verification and Analysis Kushiapa repeatedly takes ideas from the teams on how to verify the accuracy of information and accordingly gives necessary advice. However, she never imposes any opinion on the teams. Everyone analyzes the information collected by the teams after verification and confirmation. They either accept or discard some data. Then they present their experience of data collection and verification processes through Kushiapa and other groups in the classroom. Preparation and Presentation of Findings At this stage, Kushiapa asks, how can you make others know about the events of the liberation war that you have found out through this task? Everyone discusses in their groups and comes up with different creative and innovative means. Some of these are photo book, documentary, diary, poster, leaflet, photography or painting exhibition book, drama, etc. Kushiapa allows them complete freedom in this regard. However, she makes them aware of the possible challenges and issues. Keeping to her advice, the teams start implementing their plans and sharing those with the students of other classes on some national days. This time Kushiapa says, You can present your findings in front of teachers, students, parents and members of the community to your school. You can do this during the celebration of national days. These days are 7th March, 17th March, the birthday of father of the Bangabundhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman and National Children's Day, 25th March, the Genocide Day, 26th March, the Independence Day, 14th April, or Pohela Boishak, Bengali New Year, or 15 August, the National Morning Day, 14 December, the Martyred Intellectuals Day, 16 December, the Victory Day, etc. 
we will make arrangements to preserve your findings about the liberation war institutionally or nationally for further research. Based on the necessary advice and feedback from the concerned teachers, the friends of Nishargu and Onnesha organize a presentation of their project. School teachers, Thana education officers, guardians, local elders, freedom fighters are present at guests. Initiatives to conserve the memory of the liberation war. Kushiapa asks if there are any permanent way to preserve these memories of the liberation war. She says, as an accomplishment of the results obtained in your project work, you can adopt various plans or proposals. One example is the designing erection of liberation war memorials by students. You can also go for modernization or preservation or reconstruction of existing monuments or memorials in your area. You can apply schools and local administration of Upojela or district for their support and cooperation to implement these initiatives. Now let us evaluate everyone in your team using the peer evaluation table attached at the end of this chapter. Documentation Finally, the teams formally store information on various stages of their teamwork. They also store written records of self-reflection and summaries of acquired learning in pictures, videos, written form, hard or soft copies of the draft in their school by submitting those to Kushiapa.